you yeah. so much for accepting Pleasure. this invitation. My first question, you wrote a lot about prost protests, yeah. global protests. But now it seems that this protest movement is on decline. Instead, we see the new attraction of authoritarian regimes in Russia, in Turkey, and even in the US, maybe. Yeah. What do you think? Listen, uh, this two kind of processes are not, not connected. There was a major explosion of a protest activity all over the world. There was in a lot of countries with different political regimes, both democratic and authoritarian. But what was very typical for the protest movements was their anti-institutional thinking. Basically, they went on the street. Some of them managed to make an important impact on the imagination of their own societies, but then they went home. One of the interesting things that happened was that this protest managed to polarize society, but not always on the way they had expected. So as a result of it, they gave a new kind of a legitimacy to some of the authoritarian backlash. And this is very typical, for example, and can be best seen in places like Turkey or Russia. In Turkey, Mr. Erdogan managed to mobilize the support of the majority, saying, we are the people, who are you? You didn't come on the elections, you didn't come a very clear alternative. In Russia, I do believe it's uh, quite important to understand that uh, the mobilization, all this that basically started with Occupy Abai, ended up with Occupy Crimea, because there was this politicization of society, which was then basically hijacked by the government for its own purposes. So I do believe, yes, you're right. At the end of the day, part of the authoritarian rise that you see in the last two or three years is the results of the backlash against some of the protest movements that we have been seeing. Of course, in different countries, the history is different. There are places in which the protest, uh, protest movements has much more impact. For example, in the United States, of course, the protest movements didn't basically bring any type of an important leaders, but you're never going to understand neither Trump phenomena nor Sanders phenomena if you don't remember Occupy Wall Street. But in your books, you, you argue many times that well, democracy is in crisis, in trust crisis, but again, uh, there is no alternative. No alternative is seen, but now we see this new attraction of authoritarianism, of fundamentalist Islam, of fundamentalist orthodoxy in Russia as a kind of an alternative. But listen, in a certain way, none of them is justifying themselves as authoritarian. Most of them basically claim that they are majoritarian democracies. And in the case of Turkey, you have free elections. And uh, I do believe that if uh, Mr. Uh, President Putin has decided to run on the free elections, most probably he's going to win himself. So from this point of view, what is interesting is that you have a democratic regimes, which basically understand democracy simply as uh, the power of the majority, and basically the majority being embodied in the figure of the leader, uh, you don't have somebody who claims, I'm running, but the power is not coming from the popular will. So paradoxically now, it's not so much that authoritarianism comes as an alternative to democracy. Authoritarianism is presenting itself as the new face of democracy. But is it something new? Because if, if you look at totalitarianism in the 20th century, and both communism, especially fascism and Nazism, they are also were presenting as a kind of a will thing. True, but there was a major difference. Because of the nature of their ideological projects, they were justifying their power on the basis of how society is going to look like in 10 or 30 years. It is not simply the will of the people today, but the will of the people that will come. Uh, from this point of view, I do believe these authoritarian regimes are less ideological in these terms. They're much more trying to play with one of the major assumptions of democracy, the majority should rule. But in a certain way, this is a majoritarian rule in the absence of a rule of law. And this is part of the problem that we face. You also studied the issue of corruption. And here in yeah. Ukraine is a very hot issue, maybe the, the, the biggest one. But, but at the same time, we see that corruption is a global problem. And many corrupt Ukrainians, they basically, they uh, parati uh, par kind of uh, use the opportunities provided by Western schemes like offshores and others. What do you think? Uh, uh, as you know, my study of corruption was a particular one. I, was, uh, I didn't like corruption, but I always had a kind of a bad taste about obsession with anti-corruption campaigns. Because I do believe that uh, paradoxically anti-corruption campaigns can be used as an instrument for justifying uh, non-democratic regimes too. 
Uh, so what is happening is, first of all, you have a different types of corruptions. I also very much agree it's a global phenomenon. It is very much based on the fact uh, that some of uh, the major motivation of people to stay clean are not there. We try to believe that if we're going to change a law, uh, this by itself is going to change the situation, but it's very much how people feel about it. And also corruption changed its nature because of the nature of the economic regimes. In the 1970s, for example, some of the major multinational companies were very corruption friendly because then you have a protectionist regimes. And the only way, basically, to enter foreign markets was through corruption. When now you have a free trade, many of the multinationals perceive corruption as a hidden form of protectionism. Because when it comes to corruption, it's not the biggest bribe that wins. You should have trust. Basically, I can be ready to take your money because I know you, and I'm not going to take money from somebody else, particularly foreigner, if I don't know him. So as a result of it, you have in places in the world this basically middleman culture, which is appearance, and this type of a middleman, which are basically connecting one corrupt networks with another, is becoming very powerful. You remember Nokia's talk Nokia connects people, unfortunately corruption connects people too, and quite often it connects bad people. Well, how the world can overcome it? How the world can overcome this network of corruption opportunities? Listen, I do believe that the most important is that you cannot basically, and you cannot change corruption simply uh, from above. There should be a moment in which, and you can see this in different places, when society decides that it's too much. Uh, because only pressure from uh, below can change corruptions, because only the fact that people living around you are not going to allow you to, to, act, to act like this uh, uh, can change the situation. Because one of the important things is that everybody knows the scale of corruption. We all know the corrupt people. But we are very much justifying them because we say this is the game. Uh, and while this atmosphere is prevailing, nevertheless of what kind of legislation is coming, and nevertheless that probably some people are going to replace other people, this is not going to affect it. So from paradoxically, uh, the kind of a demoralization of society is the major ally of any corrupt regime. What, what, how, how can we overcome this mistrust? Because it's something that comes from the individualism, a more yeah. individualist society in today's world. How you can overcome it? Listen, for a long time, the mistrustful citizen was one of the major objectives of a good democracy because when people trust any, everything that government tells them, it ends badly. But I do believe we went on the other extreme. Today, first, people are not ready to trust anything, and which is the same thing, they trust, they're ready to trust any conspiracy theory or bullshit that they're going to hear. Part of this has to do with a major cultural change in general. Basically, we don't trust institutions anymore because some of the major institutions that have been giving us an experience together with other people we live with, for example, the army, the school, and so on, has been very much changed. Now you're not going to see the kids of the rich people in the same school and the kids of the poor people. They don't know anything about each other. I still remember an essay being written by a student in one of the very rich American colleges who on essays was on poverty and he has written, uh, for the poor man, everything is poor. His car is poor, his cook is poor, and his house is poor. So from this point of view, the fact that you cannot imagine the other, that all of us are living in the ghettos of opinions, uh, created this situation in which uh, basically you're ready to trust everything that you're going to see on your Facebook, uh, and you're not going to trust uh, things that basically you should. And this is not a problem in this country or in my country, it's everywhere. It's enough to look at uh, the American presidential elections uh, to give the fact that we're living in an age which somebody calls a post-truth politics. But if there is no trust, they cannot be trust. But don't you think that there is a new generation, I don't know, hipsters or something, like people much more open to each other, much more ready to trust? They're ready to trust each other. They're less ready to trust institutions. And this is the story. Basically, we can we are sharing much more than before. You're ready to jump on a car of somebody that you don't know. You're going to allow somebody to live in your house simply because you basically have been emailing with him. This is there. But the lack of a trust in the institution is totally uh, critical because 
institutions are cultivating trust to the stranger, that's somebody whom you don't know personally. And paradoxically, in this most open of the worlds in which we are living, we are basically back to what was typical for the tribal societies. Namely, we are ready to trust people that we know, and we are kind of quite suspicious towards uh, strangers and institutions. How to overcome it? Listen, if I knew how to overcome it, basically, <laughs> uh, I, I could have uh, said and written this. I don't believe in the universal. Uh, uh, in the universal answers, but I know that there is one thing that nobody can take out of us and this is our personal experience. And I do believe that there was a moment in which we believed that not trusting institutions makes us stronger. All these protest movements, they were so obsessed not to have leaders and so on. But now they have been defeated. And from this point of view, you understand that if you're totally mistrustful, you don't have a chance to win. I believe that this kind of experience of defeat, either in personal life and so on, as a result of this mistrust, can be the beginning of some reconfiguration. It's not going to be the same as it was, but I do believe that probably we're going to live in a much more trustful world in the future.